Next slide. Today is June 3rd, 2010. This is the start of an interview with Mr. Paul Anthony Kolzak at the IRSVP offices of Macomb County. Mr. Kolzak is 80 years old. That's great. Born July 10, 1929. Mr. Kolzak currently resides at 18325 Spring Court South, Frazier, Michigan. My name is Dave Rousseau, and I will be the interviewer, and Gary Miglia will be the videographer. Mr. Kolzak, would you state for the record the branch of service that you served? Army, U.S. Army. 49th Field Artillery Battalion connected to the 7th Division. Let's go back to uh, your early days. Where were you born? Clarksburg, West Virginia. Wow. Yes. <laughs> then we moved up to Midland, Michigan when I was about five. Midland? And where did you go to school? Uh, Midland High School. And, um, Central Michigan University, and then after service, uh, went back to UD, University of Detroit, and then went back up to Central, got my degree up there, and then came back to UD and got my master's. High school. Did you join, enlist, or did you, were you drafted? I was drafted. Was this after completion of high school? Yes. I had two years of college here. You got two years of college in? Yes. That's before you got drafted. How did you manage to get away for two years? Well, there was an exemption. You could take a math test. And wow. My master's was math. But after the two years, uh, somehow or other, they said I didn't take the exemption test. I had a copy of it, but the draft board didn't have a copy of it. So they said you didn't take it. So I went to uh, challenge that, and um, that was in August of uh, 51. And I said, that, well, everybody was on vacation. So I had nobody to talk to, I had no recourse with any action whatsoever. So I was stuck. How, how was your feeling about getting drafted? Yep. Mm -hmm. I wanted to join the Navy. I had, uh, I had gone and interviewed at the Navy, and uh, uh, they said I passed all the tests, took tests for three days at the Navy, and uh, at the end they said, I want to be a fighter pilot. And at the end they said, uh, you passed all the qualifications except one, you have flat feet. And I said, flat feet for flying an airplane? And evidently that must have been one of the restrictions. So. Yeah, well, it's a general yeah, qualification that separated people right at the front end. Yeah. Hmm. So it almost ended up in the uh, marching in the uh, you know, infantry. But I got connected Flat with feet. the artillery. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a break. At the time that you were drafted, were you still living at home? Yes. With my dad my, and my brother. So you have one brother? One brother, two sisters. Two sisters. Are they younger than you? I'm, uh, I'm the youngest. I'm the baby. Oh. Were, so, were they caught up in the service in any way? Uh, my brother volunteered right after high school. He was two years older than I was. So he, he volunteered, and it was just after the, the uh, Second World War. So he just saw uh, uh, action, no action, but uh, went to uh, Japan and served as so. Uh, um, what force did they call it that uh, washed over everything? Occupational force. So he served his time there. Your family, your mom and dad, and your daughter, your sisters, were at home? Yes. <clears throat> no, my mother passed away when I was 12 years old. Oh, I see. 
So my dad and uh, two sisters and I, we were in the farm. We had a farm out there. And how did he feel about you going in? I suppose he was used to it with your No, brother. he was upset. Yeah, well, he was sure. upset because uh, I was the only male uh, to help him around the farm. Mm -hmm. And because I figured I was going to be around there helping him. The other sister had gotten married, so it was my dad and my other sister. And we were in the farm. How big a farm was it? 80 acres. Enough to keep it busy. Yeah. Not enough to get you a deferment, though, eh? No. <clears throat> well, they didn't have, I don't know, I don't know what took her deferment then. My dad said, go in, serve your turn, and come back. Do you recall your first days in the service at Boop? In what way? Just how was it? Uh, what kind of an experience was it? Uh, we were down in Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. Uh, and of course that was in the fall. And the fall was rainy. And so it was pretty miserable. <laughs> because of the cold, humid, and rain. Uh, it really didn't get as cold as Michigan did. But yet, uh, with the humidity and the rain, it, it was pretty miserable. Where was that in Arkansas? Camp Chaffee. Yeah, but where is that? Near Fort Smith. Is that in the middle of the state, or? Um, no, it's on the west side, in the middle, sort of, mm -hmm. close to Oklahoma. I think Oklahoma is up next to it. Okay. And how long were you there? I went for basic, and then I went to um, leadership school. And um, that was... Uh, Did you need to take a test for that? Oh, well, yeah. But didn't have any problem with that. After we got through the leadership school, uh, they asked us if we wanted to go uh, and, and become officers and go to OCS. And um, I said no. A lot of the guys said yes. But if they failed in OCS, they shipped them to Korea right away anyway. Is so that the reason you said no? No, if uh, you uh, join the um, officer training school, then you'd have to uh, re enlist for two more years. Oh, I see. I said, I don't want two more years. Yeah. How was basic? Uh, yeah, it, was, you know, it wasn't bad. 10, 12, 16 weeks? You remember? Well, let me see. It was um, September, and it was. Um, January went by the time we were through, so it had to be at least two months, three months, actually. Yeah. And then the leadership school was another month, so we didn't get finished until the end of January. And okay, then, after leadership school, then what happens? Korea. They shipped you right to Korea. Yeah. What did they do in leadership to prepare you to go to Korea? Well, a different type of a training. It was um, more advanced training. Um, to be, uh, you know, sergeant or, you know, some type of a leader instead of a private. We never did get the stripes. We just, we were all were privates. And, um, but I guess it was supposed to train us for officer's training school. That's mm -hmm. really what's the purpose. Mm -hmm. So if you quit then, they said, fine. Since you don't want to become an officer and you've wasted all this time on you, you know, we're sending you to Korea. Mm -hmm. So most of us that were in leadership training went to, uh, Went to Korea. Okay. Where did you go in Korea? Went to Japan first and then stayed there about a week and then got deployed over to Korea. Um, near the Iron Triangle area. What was that like being in a different country like that? You know, I don't have a problem with stuff like that. I adjust to music to see things like that. Uh, so it, it wasn't. I didn't have a problem with that. Because you're with a bunch of guys who, uh, you know, they just take it in stride and say, well, we're here, we're here. So our term was supposed to be for a full year. And then after that, you got so many points. And then you uh, will rotate it back. But then after that, um, I don't know why uh, our captain, boys, God rest his soul, um, picked me to be a. Uh, Outpost guy. I was a forward observer. Now, a forward observer is a guy that's in front of everybody. 
and he directs the traffic of the artillery and the airplanes. There's supposed to be a lieutenant to do this. Okay? I'm a private. So this, this other sergeant and I ran the outpost. I didn't have any training for it. But of course, maybe with my mathematical background and science background, um, they figured, you know, I should. He, I don't know what he figured. But maybe that's what he was figuring. He figured you could carry it out, eh? And that wasn't hard. I mean, it wasn't even hard to do. Because once I knew the basics, and I learned it from the sergeant, and we were doing the work of a, of a lieutenant, um, we picked it up in, you know, a matter of a few days, and it wasn't, it wasn't much of a challenge. I love to, I love to drop the artillery on <laughs> certain areas. Of, that was kind of fun in a way, but it wasn't fun when they poured it in on you. So, mm -hmm. anyway. Any interesting activities other than that that went on while you were there? Well, then we were overrun. I didn't hear that. We were overrun. Oh. That, that ought to be interesting. We were in our in our position and we had everything all covered. Uh, and then, of course, there's always uh, infiltration. And um, they cut our radio. We had two supplies. We had a um, ground radio with wire and then we had the uh, air radio. And both of them were cut. Uh, and then they started bombarding our position. And then after all help, uh, then they... Uh, came up from uh, caves in the ground, about a hundred uh, yards in front of us. And just opened up the cave and just swarmed. And uh, they just overran us. And of course there was hand-to-hand -hand combat and uh, I got hit by a hand grenade that landed between my legs. Ooh. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, it, it was a wounding hand grenade. It caused uh, compound fracture in both legs. And um, so, then after that, uh, I was captured along with uh, a lieutenant came up that day. That was his first day, and he was captured with me. So him and I were captured. I think the purpose of the uh, of theirs was was to get prisoners. And both of us were captured in prisoners of war. Why would they want prisoners? Well, information. Information. And you figure anybody that's an officer, they figured I was an officer. You don't carry anything, you know, whether you're a lieutenant or anything. They figured I was an officer. Um, and the other guy was an officer, but we didn't show anything, so they figured we had all kinds of information. What was that like being a prisoner of war? Not nice. <laughs> interrogation was pretty nasty. I have to share one thing with you because I don't like interrogation, it was weird. Um, I was wounded both legs, and so I couldn't run, I couldn't move anything. They dragged me from our position to their position, which was probably about 800 yards. And how they, I mean, they just dragged me with, with lots of legs, you know. Mm -hmm. So then the interview would start, and the uh, interview went on for probably about three, four weeks. They wanted all kinds of information, and so I got the bright idea. Interesting enough, when I was going to college, I took three courses in, Japan, in, in Chinese history. Why? Because the, inter the professor who was giving the talks was so interesting, so fascinating, because him and his parents were in China. His parents were missionaries. So they grew up in China, and then they kicked him out when the, uh, when the communists came in. And so he was an instructor at Central Michigan. Just amazing, man. So I knew a lot of Chinese history, amazing. So when this guy started to start to talk about the bad history of the United States, um, how, all kinds of bad stuff, and rightly so, I mean, because there was segregation, there was all kinds of things that they could pick on, which they did. And um, I would come right back with him and say, well, you guys weren't so good either. And I would tell him about the nasty things that the Chinese history did. And um, we battled back and forth, and he did not like me. <laughs> he did not like me at all. I was outside of a hut of a lean-to laying on the ground, and he was in the hut, so he would come up and interview me. And if he didn't like what I what I was saying to him, he'd just kick me in the head or kick me or whatever. So that went on for about three weeks. 
um, brainwash. It really was a, uh, I really got to, got to know about brainwashing. Anyway, um, I got a bright idea one time. He asked me if we had any uh, new equipment. And I said, uh, no at first. And he came back and, and, and you know, started questioning me again and threatening me and all kinds of things. And I says, I says, wait a minute. I says, look it. Get me a doctor. Get me some penicillin. Get me a shot of morphine. Give me some food and a couple cigarettes, and I'll tell you about this new weapon that we have. And he says, well, we have a doctor. I said, well, let me see the doctor. So this guy comes up with a red coat. He says, there's my doctor. I go, does he know how to fix legs? Oh, yeah, he knows how to fix legs. So we settled on this, and he said, OK. I said, all right. So I described this gun to him. And at that time, I knew the weapon pretty well. Fire 400 rounds a minute, blah, blah, blah. It's good for 50 feet, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And he was squatting there, taking all this stuff down. Ding hop, ding hop, ding hop, ding hop, ding hop, ding hop, really good. So then he starts to leave, and I grab him by the ankle. So I'm on the ground. And I said, wait a minute, I want that stuff. I'm not letting go of you until, you know, you give me that doctor, you give me penicillin, and gives me a shot of morphine, and I feel food. So all this comes. I'm hanging on this guy's leg. So he says, you, are you happy now? And I says, yes, you can go. So he goes inside. The guy put two boards and wraps them up around my leg. He didn't fix anything. He just put two boards, which was nice, I guess, in a way. Two boards wrapped them up, splints, you know. And the same thing with both legs. Gave me a shot of American penicillin, American morphine. I sold it in the bottle. And so then I got some food, can't remember what it was, and two cigarettes. I lit the one cigarette and I'm laying on this lean-to and I hear this guy talking. Pretty soon he comes out and I'm sure he was sworn in Chinese. He kicked the living hell out of me. I just laughed. I had no idea. Who cares? <laughs> it was funny at the time because I didn't feel nothing. I mean, he hurt me. Um, bruised your ribs. He didn't, he didn't break a rib as I found out later. No, I thought probably a boy. But he was kicking me in the head and in the ribs. He could kick me in the face, in the legs, whatever. And he was so mad. He was just because what I did was tell him my version of their gun, the group gun. And when he found out that it was their gun that I described to him, he was mad. <laughs> and I never saw him again. Hmm. I don't know what he did or whatever happened to him, but they had a different interrogator come in after that. I thought they were going to shoot me. He had his gun out. I, I, I I'm ready to die. I mean, it didn't bother me because I figured I had this much on this guy, and I pulled his leg, and you know, I think I got one up on him. So it didn't make any difference to me. What's going to happen? So why were you only a prisoner for what, four or five months? Seven months. Seven. Well, then, uh, see, then uh, they were working at uh, on the job. I've been working at that for a year or oh, so. There was a trying to find a peacetime. Trying yeah. to find, but they did. So I mean, the war is still going on. So how did you get released? Now, part of the story is there that um, after the uh, after this interrogation camp, uh, and then I went to another interrogation camp, and that was worse because they knew what I did to the other guy. Um, then in. Um, that was in October, October, November, uh, about the first part of the second. I had no idea what, what, what day it was, what time or nothing else. The only idea they had on me was uh, my, uh, my dog tags. No, my dog tags were not there. Yes, they were. And a letter from my sweetheart. And um, so they kind of knew you know, what it was. But uh, after about the first week in December, I'm guessing, first or second week in December, I had gotten a block job at a temperature of about 104. I was in some sort of a barn. Uh, and all I can describe this as a barn because being a farmer, you know what a barn looks like. Mm -hmm. There was hay and straw and, and around them. There was, they had different areas that they had you caged off. And there I met my lieutenant again. They were captured. I didn't see him at the other place, the first extermination camp. Here he was there, so him and I were together. And he was trying to do something for me. but. Um, 
they figured I was going to die. And um, that's when I had the beautiful story about the miracle of the rosary. Uh, and that's when I had, the, my, I had my rosary, and it was all in pieces. You want me to go through this? Sure. I had my rosary, and it was all in pieces, totally dark. And I got this watch off. I can't talk. Okay, I got a fever about 100, 405. And I'm in this terrible, terrible place. Anyway, so I start saying the rosary and it's all in pieces. So I'm piecing it together in the dark, feeling my way through. So as I start the Hail Mary, Our Father, I find myself in a garden. Beautiful green garden, bushes, trees. It's not in color, it's in black and white. There's no color. So I get through with that, then I start saying um, the first mystery. Now I don't know what uh, what mystery this is, okay, until I get finished with the rosary. But as I start, I start walking down towards the right, and I'm praying, okay, and I meet four, five, six women. They don't know who I am. You know, I'm just standing in the back, and they're talking. And they're talking about, we have the oil, we have the cloth, we have to do the right thing for our Lord. And so, you know, we couldn't do it yesterday because it was a Sabbath and they're talking. Then they thought, well, how are we going to remove the stone? We're really worried about this thing. And of course, what mystery is that? What mystery is that? You know, anybody know what mystery it is? The resurrection. First glorious mystery. The oh, the resurrection. resurrection. Yeah, but all these ladies walking down oh. towards the tomb. They get to the tomb, and of course, it's empty. And I see this guy in white, an angel, and he says he's not here. Who are you looking for? He has risen. And they're babbling something or other, and they take off. And I'm at the end of the first decade, and I keep on praying. And then pretty soon I find myself walking, and I'm in a field. And in this field, there's a whole bunch of people. But in the center of the bunch of people, there are what I thought, as I think later, the apostles. And in the middle of the apostles is a guy standing white, Jesus. And he's talking to him. And I'm just standing on the outside, and he says, in a little while you shall see me, because I go to the Father. But then again, in a little while, uh, you shall not see me, because I go to the Father. But then again, you shall see me, but you will not understand this until the Holy Spirit comes out upon you. And he starts going up. And I start going up. And I'm going, I died. I'm going to happen. Hmm. So it raises and raises and raises and raises. I'm going up, 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 up. Pretty soon he goes off in one direction and I go off in another direction. And I'm still saying my prayers. El Mary's. <laughs> I'm saying I'm like crazy. And then I come into a house. I descend and my body comes down into this house and they're filled with a whole bunch of guys in there. And pretty soon you hear wind and fire. Okay, now that's the third. descend of the Holy Spirit upon the mm -hmm. And the fire descends upon each one of these guys. And they go out and they're talking and you can just hear them tongues explaining the tongues of fire. And I'm just standing there watching this. I'm, just, I'm not doing anything. It's just, just I'm an observer. I keep praying. The next mystery, of course, is the essential resurrection of heaven. I find myself in a room with a bunch of people. They're all kneeling. They're praying. And there's a bed. There's a lady on the bed. And pretty soon, like a transformation. The whole room changes, and the lady gets into an upright position, and she starts going up to heaven. Everybody's going up, and I'm going up. So I go, well, maybe this time I'm making it to heaven, because it's the essential rest of the Mary. The beautiful songs, beautiful, just absolutely heavenly. You know, you say heavenly music, it was, to me, I said, because I sang in a choir, sang in my grade school and high school and college. So I enjoyed the music tremendously. So we got up and we're just now in a whole another different area. And the last glorious mystery is the crowning of us for to in hell. Now, I'm filthy, okay? I've got blood all over my, I don't have any boots on, I don't have any shoes, because they, they took them off of me. I have these pieces of wood stuck on me, you know, and my t-shirt is torn and ripped and everything, so I don't have, I mean, I'm a filthy mess. But I want to see what's going on. 
So I start walking through this crowd of people, and everybody's singing, everybody's singing. Pretty soon I get to a spot, and there's an opening, and I look down this side, and there's a stairway. I look over this way, and there's a raised platform, and on the raised platform is a lady sitting. And I go, gee, this is really well, this is beautiful. Mm. And I look down the stairway, and there's everybody singing, and there's two people coming up the stairway, carrying on a pillow a crown. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's not one of these great big things that you see. It's one that's all around this way. It has all the jewels that you can ever imagine. Just beautiful. And they're gone, and then they stop right in front of me. And I know what they want. And I said, no, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. No, no. I tried to back up. I tried to back up. And there were so many people there, they wouldn't let me. They just look at me. No words are spoken, and I know what they want me to do. But I walk over and grab the crown. I, I'm more nervous now than I was then. Mm. Thing. So I walk over, I walk up the steps, and I put the crown up. I see what you're ready. Touch your head. Then I back away, and I look, and I see that the crown is tilted, like a sailor's hat, you know? And I go, well, that's not right. So I walk. <laughs> Walk up again, straighten up the crown, put it on, that looks good, back away. And all I see is her here to smile. Her eyes, her smile, just the most beautiful smile in the world. And I'm going, I'm in heaven. Mm. And then everything starts to fade. Everything starts to fade. And I'm going hard, I'm at the end of my rosary. And I'm praying, I'm going, and so I said, oh, if I start again, maybe I can get there again. So I start again, nothing happens. And I go, now what? So then I poke Ernie. I poke him, Ernie, 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 wake up, wake up, Ernie, Ernie, we're gonna tell you. So I tell him the story, and he goes, you know what? You're talking. Huh. You lost your lock, lock, lock job. And I used to stutter, but I'd never stuttered after that day. Hmm. And then that, I don't know how many days passed, the temperature went down enough, I guess. I don't know. But they came in and they took me out and they put me to an area uh, I found out later on for the dead. So they figured there's nothing they can do for me. I'm going to die so I'm over there with a bunch of other guys and they're all moaning and groaning. That's when the Lord took over. Because then I'm laying there and I get this inspiration that says, mentally take off your legs. You need to rest. So, I don't know if you've ever could do this. But you could actually crawl outside of your body. If you have a headache or something, you can actually take the headache and push it away. I never knew I could do this. But it was a gift. So then I said, all right. So then, literally, mentally, I would take my legs off, set them aside, and go to sleep. Then I would wake up, and I would put my legs back on again. I would talk to them. And I don't know how long this lasted. I don't know how many days or whatever. Then a miracle of all miracles happened. Background. A Chinese doctor, somehow or other, educated in the United States, went back to China, had a family, and volunteered, didn't volunteer, for Korean service. He found me. I have no idea what he was doing how he ever found me, but he was in Korea only for a week. Somehow he came to this uh, interrogation center and looked at all the wounded that were there and babbled something or other, had no idea what they did, went back outside, talked something or other, came back in, four Chinese, put me on a stretcher, picked me up, only me, and put me on the back of a truck, an open truck. And for three days, day and night, traveling, not during the day, but at night. And here I am hanging on, there's a slatted truck. I'm hanging on because my body's bouncing. I mean, as the truck is going, you know, you're on a paved road. You know? And my legs are going up and down. And how I survived, I have no idea. But I survived the three days, three nights, really, of travel. And um, 
the second night it was raining cats or dogs and they stopped at one place and I see a bunch of guys over there and ten of them are Russian. Ten of them are Russian. I can tell they're Russian. And one great big um, Chinaman, probably as big as I was, he comes over to the truck, picks me up like a little baby, carries me inside, puts me into a, a, a dry area, which is straw, covers me up with a blanket, brings water over, brings me food and stuff, and I stayed there that night, then went back the next, the next night and traveled the last distance. And then where they took me to was a all Chinese hospital. There was no American in the name. Dr. Wong was his name. He took me and with a very field x-ray machine, went over the whole body to see how many bones were broken. So then he had me on a stretcher, took me into this white room which had sheets all over it. That was the operating room and set my legs. How long had your legs not been set? October, November, Two, December, five, only two and a half months. So they probably had to re-break them to reset them? I have no idea. I have no idea. He never would be so they picked up your legs. And he would, he would come in at night, and uh, they were kind of half cast. And domos, the nurses, they would hold the leg up, still in the barn. I was in some type of a barn. You could tell it was this stall that animals were in. Mm -hmm. They would pick it up and they would take the top layer off and then they would take all the bandages and redress it, put it back again. And they would sit there and, and talk. Hmm. Amazing. So he saved my life. And he was responsible for me for, for Operation Little Switch. It was uh, designed to exchange wounded for wounded. Mm -hmm. And that happened on April the 23rd for me. And then later on, uh, I think it was in August, and the war was over with, and then everybody, everybody was exchanged. So how long were you in this barn, like? Well, there, f about a week. Then they brought in a um, black Negro, name was Wil Wilbur Waring. So him and I were the only two Americans in this place. And then, and then they moved us to a cave. It was three stories high, and we were put up on the third floor. And um, that's where they took care of us there. I mean, they couldn't do any more operation-wise, so we were recuperating in a sense. And um, it was a place where all the wounded Chinese were. Certain times, uh, this was around Christmas time, certain times in the night you would hear a train, and then they would take all the wounded out, Chinese wounded, evidently put them on the train, the next morning would be the only two there and then would fill back up again, and this would go on. The only, another good thing that happened was that uh, they, they wanted us to write letters back home. Well, when I was doing this in the interrogation camp, they would take the letters and use it against you. Because whatever you said in the letter, they would take it and say, ah, oh, you know, shouldn't say this about us. We're not, we're not bad people. And we understand that you like this and that and that. So they would use whatever we said in the letter against us. So, when two doctors came to us at Christmas time, um, just come up to say hi. They were both spoke English. And they said, uh, how would you like to write a letter back home? Of course, suspicion. Right yeah. Out. He said, yeah, we'd love to. You know. So he came back the next day with his doctor and gave us a small book, which I have, and um, gave us some paper. And he says, I have a friend in Beijing. He says, I will send this letter to them in Beijing, and they have contacts in the United States. And they will send a letter to their contact in the United States, and your parents, whoever you're adjusted to, should get the letter in maybe a month or two. And I said, beautiful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So in the letter, I was very cautious about what we said. But as we found out, that was at Christmas time, and the letter got to our parents the end of February. That was only the letter of the country. So they were good for the words. Aren't they? So how beings. long had it been since you had communicated with your family? Well, since you know, the summer. So they didn't know whether I was missing an action or, or dead or, or what. Or they didn't know what it, they didn't know what it so was. So your, 
parents didn't know anything about the rules. Um, the United States didn't know where you were. No. I don't know what the procedure is. How long? Missing an action, they call it. They call all oh, that. So they told your folks you were missing. Missing an action. Oh wow. They don't know whether you know. Then, then missing an action can be all kinds of things. Yeah. Well. First thing I would think of is you're dead, you know. Sure, that's what they thought. Wow. Boy. So when they got that letter, they were. Uh, what? That happy. must have been quite a letter to get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't get any worse than dying. <laughs> you get the letter, what the hell? All of a sudden, he's alive. Wow. Yeah, he's alive. Yeah. Wow. So, you, know, you leave this. Uh, Barn. Where do you go from there? Up to the cave. Up, we were in a cave for probably, you know, time is really rough because I had no way to yeah. tell. I knew it was Christmas time because they told us it was Christmas time. These two doctors brought us two apples, which was a treat. Mm -hmm. And then they moved us back. They had built some, they must have back to the same place. They must have built some uh, new housing, new housing. They were long buildings, elevated platforms on both sides with a walkway in the middle. And on the elevated side, uh, they were, you, know, you could put beds. And they had boards in between, and they had straw, and you could put uh, five guys on each side. Mm -hmm. So we got back to that, or we got went to that, and there was uh, Wilbur and I and a Puerto Rican for a while. And then, um, and then there were six uh, Australians that were captured, that were wounded, and they came and occupied the place with us. So the six, seven, eight, nine. One more, ten, uh, was an American guy who was a uh, who was a, an Air Force guy, and uh, he was, his his plane was shot down, and uh, yeah, his legs were really bad, and they amputated both of his legs. So there were the ten of us in this area that was from February until April. When, when we ah, it's still out. cold over there then, isn't it? You know, it wasn't bad in the hut. No. Uh, because it stuck like crazy. It's not, I mean, can you imagine? All ten of us have got cast on. We're suffering in one way or another. And there's no ventilation. So we kept each other warm. At the end of the hut, one end was a door, one the other end they had a, a peat fire going. And on that peak, they had water. And that's the way they purified their water. So if you wanted water, well, that's where you got your water from. They had, they had somebody that uh, would wait on us, come in. And, and At this stage, water. were you able to walk? No. Oh. No, it took another year before I could walk. Yeah. Really walk, though. So what happens after you leave the cave? Then? We went to this hut where the ten of us were. Working. And we stayed in that hut until we were repatriated. The ten of us. Mm -hmm. And what happened that caused you to just an exchange? Is that the idea? Well, the you know, Pam and John, they were trying to figure out some sort of a peace thing. So they finally agreed on this that they would exchange the wounded. So the more serious wounded that we had of their prisoners would be exchanged for the most serious wounded that the Chinese and Koreans had um, of us. So that's so they exchanged the uh, wounded. Now, what was behind this movement of you in the truck? What what was that all about? Do you know what caused the doctor to? Well, because you? You... well, the interrogation center had to be close to the lines. I, I figured, and so in order to get to the uh, camp. I'm guessing, I really don't know for sure, I think we were in Camp 5, but uh, I don't know. So that's quite a distance. That's quite a distance from there. I mean, there's, you know, and it's rough terrain, so they have the roads, but, uh, and they can only travel at night. Because mm -hmm. if they travel in the daytime, they could, uh, you know, our airplanes would bomb us. As a matter of fact, coming back, when we were on, we were on the road back to repatriation, they traveled by night. And so we were all in this truck. And uh, one time, uh, our American uh, planes, you know, they dropped flares and stuff, and they and they knew where the, and they bombed they bombed us. Thank goodness, I mean, our truck didn't get hit, but they didn't know who was there. No. 
So they just found that we could look back um, and see that they were, they were bombing ahead of all these people back there mm -hmm. because it was a whole truck convoy. Mm -hmm. hmm. So then when we got to the exchange center, then, oh, they shaved us and they gave us toothbrushes mm -hmm. and gave us a haircut and mm -hmm. they were right. Hmm. Gave us gave us a carton of cigarettes. Terrible. It would spit and sputter, and your mouth almost some of them even Crazy. <laughs> so I gave them away as I came back. I knew the people want a souvenir. Want a souvenir? Here's a souvenir of Chinese cigarettes. That's crazy. So what happens to Paul now? Well, oh, I got to tell you another thing. Uh, when I was in a camp being delirious, I guess, uh, the second interrogation camp when I had the temperature, I would have dreams that the back of this barn would open up and there was a helicopter out there. And American guys, soldiers would come out and grab all the wounded and put them on the helicopter. And by the time they got to me, the Chinese knew that they were doing this and so they would start firing and they always left me. I was always the last one, and they could make, I, I never got to go. So they'd get all these other wounded guys, and they'd hop in the hel helicopter and take off. They used to be a repeated nightmare for me, over and over again. And so when I would go to sleep at night, they'd go, oh, here it is again. And so it would just bother the hell out of me, because I don't understand. They says, why don't they pick me up first, you know? Now, at the exchange point, Okay, I'm still on the stretcher. So they carry me off the stretcher. Everybody welcomes you. Welcome back to the United States. You know, I mean, just a great, great, great uh, um, tribute by a lot of these people as, you know, as they're carrying everybody off. And then they set me down. And they, um, I don't know what they decided, but they had to set me down for a particular spot. And I'm sitting there, or, or laying there, and a nice warm blanket and had some water. I guess they, they gave me some water. and. Um, I look over, and what do I see? What do I see? A helicopter. Oh. Yeah. I see this helicopter, and I go, oh, God, it's going to happen again. So I just close my eyes and I pray. I mean, I prayed the rosary every single day <laughs> after that. And I, kind of an interesting thing, I kind of guessed that the day that my miracle happened was on a Sunday. And as it turned out, I kept track of the days by that. It was a Sunday that that, that happened, mm -hmm. by keeping track of the rosary. I didn't know what month it was, but I knew that it was Sunday night. So I'm going, all right, what's going to happen? So I'm, I got my rosary, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying. So after a while, then they picked me up and put, on, put me on the helicopter. Now I'm wondering, OK. Then they put three or four other guys on, all stretchers. And then it takes off. I can't explain to you, but there must have been a barrel of tears that flowed from my heart. I just, I knew it was real. Then I knew it was real. I probably cried for days. But now the helicopter picked me up. So where did it take you? To the um, Seoul Army Hospital. We just stayed there overnight. And then they took us to uh, um, Japan. And they had an army hospital in Japan, and they checked us all out over there. About two weeks, we got a chance to send the telegram home. They checked us all out, did everything that they could for us after about two weeks. And uh, could have any food you wanted. Mm. You couldn't eat. Couldn't eat. I wanted, I wanted French toast. I mean, you know, why? French toast? Who goes for French toast? But I think I could eat one piece, and, and this, well, the stomach couldn't handle it. Mm. Of course, they fed us a lot of rice when we were prisoners. Yeah. So they asked us if we wanted rice. <laughs> we said, shove it up here. <laughs> <laughs> now we said, you can keep your rice, please. They had psychiatrists and everybody else that came. Uh, General Clark was there, and his wife, we interviewed him. That was a good time. Then they flew us back to the States and uh, took to Hawaii, stayed about four days in Hawaii, treated us real nice there, put us on buses. Were you able to walk at that point yet? Yeah, I was still on, on, no. on a letter. And then they flew me back to uh, 
uh, Percy Jones Army Hospital in uh, Battle Creek. And that's where I started my, uh, started walking my physical therapy. Why there? So, I mean, that was the best hospital in Michigan for, for, for us. It was the only hospital for Army Hospital in Michigan at the time. And then from there, we went to a VA hospital in Dearborn. So you were in the service two years in total. And yes. Most of that time, prisoner of war, huh? Seven months. Seven months. Mm -hmm. Never did get a lieutenant ship. All I got was a corporal. I wanted to talk to that Captain Boys. Put me in that particular spot. Should have given me some sort of a grade raise, you know. Mm -hmm. hey, tell us about the medals. Well, I don't know what medals I have. Do I have them down there? So the Korean Service Medal, that was probably just because you occupied. Yeah. Bronze service star, two. Two bronze service stars. For particular battles that we were in. And survived. <laughs> and the UN service medal, that's probably just again another. Yeah, that's just a gimme. Occupation. Well, they're not gimmies. It, it, you have to be in a certain area for a certain amount of time. Yes. Yeah. You, you get a medal. You get a combat submarine medal if you're in a combat zone for six months in a sub. Yes. Yeah. Who the right. hell wants to be in a combat zone for six months? You know, yeah. in a sub of all places. <laughs> Purple Heart is there. Purple Heart. What was that one? Injury. Yeah, that was that was the two legs. Is it, is it the? Um, Awarded in in battle. Yes. Wounded. Yeah, hand to hand uh, combat. Uh, what was that like? Can you remember? Yes. You want to talk about yeah. that? Okay. Let's go back to the to the miracle. I got a question for you. Sure. The crown. Was there actually twelve stars on the crown? I don't know. I didn't turn it around. I mean, I was just, here I was an observer all this time, mm -hmm. and now they want me to do something. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, no, I don't know whether they're 12. The mystery speaks of a crown of 12 stars. Yeah, well, there were stones in it. They don't know what the stars yeah. are. I well, there might have been the stones, too. I don't know. Yeah, they could have been. I know there was a diamond, there was a ruby, there was a green one, um, there was an opaque one, uh, and uh, the four that I remember, you know. I don't look at it. I just. You ever been able to figure out what that was all about? No, it, uh, you know, I came back and I talked to all kinds of priests and nuns. Mm -hmm. I said, what am I supposed to, am I supposed to be, am I supposed to join the priesthood? Am I supposed to mm -hmm. um, join some sort of a, a brother or, or mm -hmm. a, become a monk or something? I, I had no idea what, you know, what, what my purpose was. So. Um, this one guy who played basketball with me, I played, I played semi-pro when I was in college. I, that was, I played college and I played semi-pro sort of at the same time, but that was kind of a... Anyway, this buddy of mine uh, lived in Trenton. I was in the VA hospital in Dearborn, and he came up and saw me. A lot of my friends came, but he says, hey, I know a good priest in, uh, in Trenton. Uh, maybe, he, maybe he'll tell you what to do. So he came over, his name was Father Brackett, and him and I hit it up. Just like that. Yeah. They had an outdoor patio. They had an outdoor patio that was enclosed, and so we, he would come every weekend, and we would sit there and talk. And um, he says, you know, I don't know what you're supposed to do. He says, but I got an idea what, what we can do. So he says, can you get off a weekend? And this is when I had some time, and I could get. So he said, uh, come over to Trenton, this church, and uh, we'll set something up for you. I said, well, what? He said, don't worry about it. Just come over. He said, come over there and go to a small chapel. There's about six or seven nuns and Father Bracken and myself. And he says, we're going to dedicate you to the West Virgin Mary. He said, that's the only thing I can think of. And I think from there, you'll get some help. 
So we had a nice little service. I dedicated myself to Blessed Virgin Mary, and I do that every year. And so uh, when my wife and I got married, um, both of us dedicated ourselves to Blessed Virgin Mary with Father Bracken. And now we can do it ourselves with just a simple thing, a little prayer that we say. And so we dedicate ourselves to the blessed life of Blessed Virgin Mary, and she has been in our life ever since. And so I know all the things that have happened because of because of her intercession. The other thing that was wrong with that is that I wanted to be a science person. I wanted to go into research. Because now I had, I had, um, I, was, I majored in physics, chemistry, and math. And so um, I wanted to be a research scientist. So when we get married, I go to, uh, we went on our honeymoon, went to Arizona. I saw air research, so I went there and he said, you guys need uh, a good scientist? And they looked at my credentials and they said, where are you right now? I said, I'm not finished yet. I got another year to go. He says, well, leave your credentials here. When you get the, the uh, whatever, send us that, and we'll hire you, because we're looking for people like you. I said, great, okay, wonderful. So I graduate, I call him up, send him all the in information and stuff, and he says, I'm sorry, I'm not hiring. This was 1958 in Depression. He says, everybody, I'll pick a fruit someplace. He says, we probably could back on our feet in about two or three years, depending upon the government. The only thing that was open was teaching. I didn't want to teach. I did not want to teach. No? I said, who want to deal with these kids? You know? So then um, I, I go, I have to teach. So I, I teach for two years. I teach at Notre Dame High School. This other guy and I are both math and science teachers. And we said, let's get out of this. So we both set up an interview for IBM. So we go down to IBM, bring our, all of our information. I get locked out. I can't talk. The other guy, Joe, and I, he gets hired. He says, the guy that was interviewing us, he says, well, your credentials, he says, we'll hire you today. Mm. We need you. I says, well, I have some questions. Right now, I have some questions I'd like to ask, so I'll come back next week. And he says, fine. So we made an appointment for next week. Joe's hired that day. During that week, I had applied a month or so ago, the National Science Teachers Association, for a grant to get my master's. So during that week, the OK comes in from the National Science Teachers Convention and says, we will pay for your tuition, we'll pay for this, we'll pay for this, we'll pay for that, and it's all covered, and you're covered by the GI as well, and so you go get your master's at University of Detroit. Take your one full year, full, full ride. So I go back to AT&T and Bell and, and IBM and says, I'm sorry. I gotta go. I mean, here's an opportunity to get my master's and it's free, so I'm going. I said, all right, give us a call and you get back. Strike two, right? Okay. So now I'm all through the end of the year and I'm interviewing, I'm, I set up interviews with different companies. On the day of graduation, I got a blood clot in my leg. So I am in a hospital. I'm in a the hospital there and I'm arguing with God. I think I'm angry with I think I, he says, I want you to be a teacher. I, says, I don't want to be a teacher. I want you to be a teacher. I don't want to be a teacher. Dang it, I don't want to be a teacher. I want you to be a teacher. So I kept saying. Pretty soon, this, uh, one, of the, one of the days, the guy that runs this thing from UD came up to saw me, uh, see me, and he, uh, um, we were going over things, and he says, he says, I have some openings for you. You could teach at this college, this university, this university, whatever. And I says, I don't want to teach. He said, did you read the fine line? You have to teach or else you have to pay back all the money. I said, I didn't see that. I did not see that. He says, well, these are openings. You can teach at any one of these colleges because they ask me, you know, for people with a math background, science background, and so they're looking for people. So I go, all right, when do I get out of here? So it took me a while before they get out, before the thing healed. By the time I get out, all those places closed. So the only thing I could get 
was that one can't, one can tell the different schools. And so I, I says, all right, I'll teach at one consolidated school. I'll teach two years, then I'll go. Right. That's still not. <laughs> After two years, I taught at one time. I'd set up some schedules again, right? May, during the month of May, I got another blood clot. My leg. Now I'm in the hospital, and I'm, I'm. <laughs> God, why do you want me? I want you to be a teacher. I don't want to be a teacher. You don't want to be a teacher. Then all of a sudden, out of the clear boom, comes Dr. Wong's voice. Because him and I talked. May I tell you before? And it's, um, he says, he said, you're going to be a teacher. And I argued with him then. I said, I'm not going to be a teacher. Out of the clear boom comes his voice and says, Paul, you're going to be a teacher. All right, I give. I give. I'll be a teacher. But I need your help because I don't want to be told. And uh, I did. So for 36 years, as a matter of fact, I'm still teaching. I'm teaching teachers now during the, uh, during the wintertime. Workshops and stuff. And teach at, um, I put on with uh, this other guy uh, at the Michigan Science Teachers Convention in Lansing. We've been teaching there since 1988. We've been teaching at the National Science Teachers Convention since 1988. So this is under the guidance of who runs that well, program the, for teaching the teachers? Uh, I work with the ISD, Intermediate School District. So I work with them. And, um, Just the Warren? No, all of them, o uh, Oakland, Warren, and uh, Wayne. We teach our, um, we hold the classroom at the zoo. They have a new educational building down there. They've got four rooms upstairs, really nice rooms, and so we uh, we teach them in one of them. So this uh, way, it's a center for um, Wayne and Macomb and Oakland. So teachers come from any one of these three areas. So that's Is there any major college affiliated with this? They can get college credit. They can get college credit. They have to. Um, be there for the full hour, they have to sign ahead of time, and uh, so they can get college credit for it, if they want. So it's a nice program for them. So your disability then was with your legs? Yes. Yeah, it was 80% for a long time, and then they raised it up to 100. Oh, really? Yeah. I have a loss of the use of one limb, the right leg, because the, the knee is ankylosed. That means that the femur and the fibula, by Dr. Wong, because he was so madly um, mad, mangled, mangled, that he fused them together. And so it, I call him insane. Of course, now after all these years, this leg has been doing all the work, and now this leg is starting to get, get tired. When you got back, how did you? Your wife. When I was going to UD, oh, I see. yeah, see, I, it, kind of a, I was going to Central, when the service came out, when I was in a hospital, I asked if I could work, when I could get up and move around, and they said no, because you have to come back for physical therapy and for psychiatric treatment. So I said, okay, can I go to school? And they said yes. So I was in the Detroit area, so I signed up for UD. Okay, and I was going to UD. Um, and then at that time, my roommate was my wife's brother. And his father asked me to be his roommate because his, because his name was Dennis. Dennis was failing. And he wanted me, here I'm just out of, fresh out of, you know, out of, the, out of the war and I'm free and easy and I got my car and I'm, I don't want to be bothered with anybody. But anyway, he asked me to be his roommate. So that make sure that he passed all of his classes. I said, "How am I going to do that?" You know. Well, we were both in engineering, so I said, "Okay." So I would check his homework, and, and if he did his homework, which I looked like it did, then I would treat him to a beer and a, and a whatever, you know, at this at this bar. He wasn't 21, but he was mm -hmm. used to do it anyway. Mm. So that's how we met. So then met him, went to his house one time in Muskegon, and that's how I met his uh, sister. And how big is your family? Seven children. Any grandchildren? 
16. 16. Four grades. Four grades. Are they all in the area? So you can... No. Um, we've got one kid living in Kansas City. Uh, he has three children. Uh, so there are just grandchildren. And we've got uh, three of them in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, two in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we've got two of them there, grandkids there. Uh, one daughter's not married, and one son's not married. One son's in the National Park Service, and the daughter has uh, just got through with college and uh, her second term. And um, she's, uh, she's working, but uh, she never got married. So we've got three of them living in the area. Two sons and um, and a daughter that live uh, in the area. And what are you doing now? I'm still uh, working, putting on these workshops. Great. We put on last summer, but uh, this summer we're not doing it because uh, the money is tight at all the schools, and so it's hard to send teachers. So um, this summer we're doing some traveling. You know about the uh, thing in Washington D.C. that they're having celebration for the 60th anniversary of the Korean War. No. And they're at, then, then one of the things that they're doing is that they are having the Korean Little Angels are going to perform at the Kennedy Center Performing Arts mm. on Wednesday and Thursday of next month. And so all Korean veterans can call in or whatever and get tickets if they want. I found out about this about a month ago. So we got our tickets. So my one son and his wife are coming, and we're going, so the four of us are going. So I sent them a copy of that thing that they wanted to know about you. And they also go online and find out about you too, which is scary as all hell. <laughs> so anyway, so then she calls up and she says, we would like to have you come up on stage during the intermission, and we're having several people up there, and we'd like to... I'm really honored. We want you to be on stage to represent the POWs of Korea and receive a medal on their behalf. Oh, great. And I, what do they have to call that medal? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I, I, I'm just, I'm speechless because why, you know, why me? I mean, I've asked this question throughout my whole story. Mm -hmm. Why me? And so here's another honor given to me for it. You've been designated. I, I, I'm, I just feel so unworthy. Because mm -hmm. I know the guys went through much more hell than I did. You know, and so I'm happy to represent them. But I don't know why, you know, why me. So that's kind of a special treat. So we're going to be there on Thursday uh, at the show, which is at 7 o'clock, I think, uh, Thursday night. So I says, what do I do? Do I? And this gal, she's pretty friendly, and uh, so we got to talking pretty good about a lot of things. And so she says, when you go up there, she says, they're going to talk a little bit about who you represent and all the other guys one at a time, and one of the little angels, I think which are high school age kids, girls, one of the angels will put the ribbon around your neck. And I said, what do I do? You want me to talk? She says, I don't want you to talk. She says, you talk too much anyway. <laughs> I said, well, what do I do? I said, can I give her a hug? She said, I think a hug would be appropriate. I said, you sure I don't want to talk? She said, you want to talk? I said, no, I don't want to talk. She said, she, said, she said, they may ask you. She said, I don't think so, though. If they do, she says, something short and sweet would be nice. So I said, why did you pick on me? She says, in a funny way, she said, you're closest to the front, so you're going. But that's an honor. It really is. Whatever happened to your lieutenant friend? He came back home um, and uh, settled down, raised a family, and um, went and saw him a couple of times. So we stayed in touch with one another. But his story is so weird. He was he just graduated from college, and he was an ROTC, and he was a lieutenant, and they gave him I don't know how long, maybe about a month or two months of training. <coughs> and they shipped him right over. He got over there. He was with us one day, and that night it happened. Mm. Can I have some water? Oh, mercy, yes. <coughs> 
So he had two or three children, and he lived in uh, South Bend, Indiana. The guy I really stayed in touch with was the Australians. Yeah. We became very, very close friends. Great. This one guy in particular, like you name Eric Donnelly. And so we um, we became very fa fast friends, and uh, three of the other ones too. So one year they came up here, and the first time we looked at one another, he says, that's the first time I've ever seen you with a shirt on. Mm -hmm. Because when we were in this long hut, elongated hut, uh, we didn't have shirts. I just had my, I don't know if I had any shorts on at all. I had my cast on. <laughs> so, of course, we were both laying down, so we never really, he had a cast on his legs. So we never really saw one another. We became very fast friends. We went down there. Um, he came up here. We went down there. We went to Hawaii together. And uh, very, very, very fast friends. Two years ago, he passed away. And uh, I saw him the year before that because I knew that he was uh, physically, mentally um, going downhill. He was in a home at that time. But we went and saw him uh, the year before he passed away, which was. A good thing. Anything else you'd like to add to your story? Mm. Do you want to hold up this? This was the picture with the, the rosary and the senior my news. I have all kinds of other stuff that you yeah, can show. Yeah, why, why don't you show us? You can put that up there. Do you want to tell us a little bit how that happened? Now that's the rosary that you, you had in Korea. Yes. You had it restrung, put back together again? No. No, it's, it's got this, that in the same form. It's still in pieces. They still have it. So how did this article? My son found out about this gal that uh, Christine, and found out that she did things on uh, senior citizens. So he asked her if she wanted to do. And so then she called me and said, is it OK if I come and interview you? And I said, uh, you know, what about? She says, about your experience. And I said, yes, I think it's, because I never wanted to talk about this before until the last two years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it was quite private. I told my family, you know, a few things. And, uh, but it was very private for me. I, it, mm -hmm. But then after I talked to our priest one time, he says, you know, it's about time you shared it. Yeah. Because I think you really should. So she came, interviewed me, and she said, it'll take about a half hour, and she was there for three hours. Wow. So we had a good time, and she did a wonderful job on that. So I'm very honored by that. Any questions you folks have? I think he's got a few other things to, to show. There was one time, I don't know how I actually got this thing, but I got a, a book from a um, Chinese book. Oh, there's a couple of other things, yeah. And um, Chinese cards, playing cards, oh. and a shaving kit that, was, uh, that belonged to a Chinese wounded and somehow or other I was placed in his bed after he had left and um, all these things were left there. So uh, I confiscated them and they let me keep it. Oh, Korean service for that. This is about, I don't know. Do, do you know what the, the little book is? It was just a, just a, like a diary, a Chinese knife. There's a shaving kit in here someplace. And um, the book, what I used it for was, uh, uh, I try to keep track of, uh, I made it a diary, and I can hardly read it, <laughs> uh, of the days that passed from about January. So it's a little diary about that, about uh, my story there. Oh, wow. And then this is the book that the uh, 
doctors gave me at Christmas time. Yeah, another diary book. And they said you didn't keep track. So in this, I kept track of the words that I was trying to pick up in Chinese because I was trying to learn their language because I don't know how long I was going to be there. I was going to be there for two days, three years, mm -hmm. ten years, you know. So they said, well, I was trying to pick up their language, so I tried to learn their language. And as I tried to learn it, I would give my interpretation and I would write it down. And then I also had them autograph it. So the, so the doctors that gave this to me, I says, well, you might as well autograph it and put something in there. So they would write, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, as they did in Chinese. And then I had Dr. Wong uh, autograph it. And uh, I would have any Chinese person that came in, I would say, autograph my book. So it saved my neck one time because um, there used to be a, called the, uh, FBI guy, or the guy who was um, the mental health, we called him. He was, uh, he was the, the guy that tried to give us a tough time. He was the interrogation officer. And so he would come into this hut that we were in, this elongated hut, and raise all kinds of help. You people are showing your flashlight, you're showing the bombers and the airplanes, you know where we're at, and you can't do that. And none of us could move out of the hut. But he would come in and try to bring washes. So one time he comes in and he comes right up to me and says, I want to see your book. And I go, what book would you want, sir? The book that you're hiding. I know that you're hiding a book in there and that you're making all kinds of notes and I want to see it. So I get this one out and I says, if you would like, I'm getting autographs of people. Would you like to autograph my book? Because I'm trying to learn your language. See back here, here's words, and I showed her what I was doing with it. And these are people that have signed this and autographed my book for me. So if you would honor me, could I have your autograph? Well, blew the wind right out of his sails. <laughs> so he looked and stubborn and, and read the names in there and he goes, oh, oh, okay. I have about eight or ten names in there already. So I said, would you please honor, honor me by signing it? So he did. Oh, never saw my other one. I don't know what he would have done because we weren't supposed to be doing that sort of stuff. You got one in here too. Mr. Paul, I hope you will be health. Do all effort for peace. Dr. Wang? One. That's my angel doctor. Well, then there was another one in here from... Very similar another to Another Dr. Wong, and it said, dear Mr. Dear, to dear Paul, we will be good friends in a peaceful world. I suspect there's a lot of people that I've heard before that were not really into the war, they were into peace and... What's your name, Dave. Dave, I'm convinced there are people in the world who want peace. Mm -hmm. Because Dr. Wong and I were talking, he says, you know, Chinese people are peaceful people. Mm -hmm. He says, it's the dictators in our socialistic government yeah. that tell us what to do and where to go. He says, we just want a place to live, a place to work, a place to raise our kids, mm -hmm. and have a, a life yeah. without a lot of struggle. He says, we all want that. He says, all the Chinese people want that. He says, the Korean people, basically, if you really want to meet the Korean people, they want the same thing. Yeah. It's the people who get in government, who try to run the life of these people, Yep. and to tell them what to do, that really is disruptive. And so there's so many things that, uh, all these governments, and none of them really are happy, none of the people are happy. I can tell you about this. When I came home, I lived in Midland, as I said. Uh, another, you know, why me thing. I was in a hospital and this guy comes up, Mr. Gordon, and he says, Mr. Klozik, I represent this club from Midland, Michigan, and we are very honored and proud to present to you a car. We want you to come to Midland, when you can come to Midland, and we will present this car to you as a, for service done, you know, to the, whatever, for the service that you've done for the country and coming back. And I said, wow, thanks. So one weekend I went to Midland 
and um, they presented me with a brand new Studemaker. Really? Hmm. And all the um, gas, oil, and maintenance was taken care of for a year, as long as I could take it back to this ga one gas station. So I had a car, and as I was, uh, they had several different places that they did presentation. First the car, then another place, and then I went to the fairgrounds and they had another presentation. And on one of them they gave me the keys to the city. Hmm. Hmm. Presented to the veterans of the Korean conflict, and I think they gave it to all the Korean veterans. Mm -hmm. That says, keys to the city of Midland. Nice. Isn't that neat? Yeah. Very cool. And I, I didn't do anything for that. But see, and it's another one of those, why me? No answer. Why By the not? way, they I have the same birthday. July 10th? Mm -hmm. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> So Midland was very good to me, very, very, very good to me. I would take the car out on weekends, okay, from the Percy Jones Army Hospital and from and from the VA hospital, okay? And um, I drove with my leg across the front because I couldn't drive with this thing, and there was enough room then. So during one year, I got 50, over uh, around 54,000 miles in one year, just on weekends. Mm. I mean, I went every place to any place. Any place to every place I could go. So all my buddies, we can go and call them up, tell them I'm coming, and they say, come on, you know, so that was nice. After one year, I had my heart set on a Packard. 56 Packard. 54, no, 54 Packard. This was 50, 53, 54, 55. 55 Packard. Yeah, 55 Packard. So I traded this car in, and I got $1,500 from the government for the purchase of a car. They, they did that at the time, if you were wounded and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so with those two together, I got this 1955 Packard. What a sweet thing. Oh, man. You still have it? No, I wish I did. Did you cruise up and down when you were dead? Huh? Yes, yeah, I would. Yes, yeah. I would. Yes, I would. It it um, mm -hmm. it started to burn oil, as you know, old cars would. Yeah. After uh, I don't know how long I've had it for about you know, four years. Okay. Started to burn oil about uh, two years or so. So I took it to a Packard dealer, and they were supposed to put new rings in. That's what you're supposed to do. I don't know what they did, but after I got it out of the garage and drove it, it still burned oil. So I took it back, and they said, "Sorry." <laughs> We did everything we could, but I'm convinced that they didn't. I'm convinced that they either put the wrong rings in or something, or and so um, I didn't have enough money to have it done again. It cost like I don't know six, eight hundred dollars to get the car thing done. So over a period of time, it just burned so much oil, and it just, I cried when I left. Yeah. I think that's it. What else can I say? Oh, you want some Chinese cigarettes? You still <laughs> have them. <laughs> oh my god. These ought to be great now. <laughs> yeah, they sparked back then, huh? Wow. Yes. I thought I brought my rope. What did they make these out of? The same thing we did? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what they made it out of, but uh, they didn't uh, have the, such a fine one. Uh, the fine tobacco that we usually had, I don't think I've got mine with me. It smells sweet. Mm. Sweet. Oh, that's the cream. Yeah. No. no, I didn't bring it. I'm sorry. I didn't bring my rosary that's uh, that. Anybody need a rosary? No, I had one from uh, Medjugorje. Oh, yes. You've been there? Yeah. Yeah, we have two. You know some? I bought back maybe a dozen, dozen and a half of those things. Big, handmade, wooden, can't break that sucker. Oh, those, yes. Yes, I, yeah, I have rosaries in case. Um, 
People need one. Need Those come in a, a break. And I'll take one for my mom. How about It's blessed. Oh, neat. Do you need one? I got one from yeah. the Pope. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I keep pursuing it. I don't know. So, well, and the, uh, well, the very last thing is that something that uh, my sister did for me, you don't want to go through this thing, but the book that she put together, God love her, she kept track of pictures, newspaper articles, uh, the original letter that was sent to her, to my dad, um, family pictures of, um, she started when I was missing, and her letters to the army to find out where I was and what I was doing. So, so that was kind of a very special book that she put together. And and that's a that's a picture of you coming back. This is another one of you know why me thing. Uh, when we went from uh, Korea to Japan on a globe uh, globe trotter globe. Uh, one of those Globemasters. 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 General Clark was on board and he made sure everybody was comfortable. When I got off of this thing, you know, I'm on a stretcher and they're going to take me into Tokyo Army Hospital. And they grab a hold of me and stop me and they use me as the cover boy. <laughs> they come out with a bulletin, a little paper. And so they had, had, you know, not that much about. This guy is one of the POWs from Korea, and his name is Paul Klosik, and you know, so and so forth. So. so I go, wow, I'm on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> That's pretty special. Look at that. I did bring my laser. Is that the one? Good, crazy. Now, where did you get that? I have no idea. It, it was one that you that you. I, you know, I took with me. I always carry a rosary in my pocket. My mother always told me, when I when we were small, carry a rosary in your pocket. When you don't have nothing to do and you're standing around, get your hands in your pocket, say a rosary. So it was it was one that your mom had given you. Probably not. Because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an adult now. I probably bust of all the rosaries that she ever gave me. I would like to think maybe it was, but it, but it wasn't. Hmm. That's something. Yeah, it was all part because of the, uh, well, of course, what, what my body went through when they dragged me through the field, you know, and uh, somehow or other I. You know, how do you put your... You got some beads, Nessa. Yep. How are you So delicate, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it looks so rusty right now, so... Did you ever have a rosary change color on you from Medjugorje? Uh, no. I bought a very expensive one. It was a glass bead type of thing. And... Um, Went to Medjugorje. No, no, I didn't go to Medjugorje yet. Um, I had it, this was after we heard about Medjugorje. And it started to change color. Mm -hmm. It changes like to a bronze. Some people say gold, but I call it bronze. And um, my brother got sick with cancer. And so I gave him the rosary, um, you know, to help him out, whatever. Because he, he he was in a hospital and he didn't have his rosary, so I gave him my rosary. And um, he wondered why the color was different. And I go, I don't know. So then I got to know, just like it. Uh, Marion Peace Center, we go up there at Boeing Mountain. They have a conference up there every uh, fall. We've been going there for years. And um, so I bought another one. And um, another friend of mine, who, um, very good friend, and uh, she was sick. She had um, lung, uh, sorry, lung disease and from smoking. And so that one started to change color. 
And so I says, okay, so then I gave that one to her. And um, then I bought another one that was different. It wasn't the same thing. And my wife looks at me and she's got a set that's changing color. I hadn't noticed. So then I, the third one I got, my wife started to look at it and says, you know, this one's changing color. You know, I think it's time we went to Medjugorje. <laughs> so, so we went, what a peaceful place. Yeah.